This is the video for pre-lecture 19. So in the previous lecture we looked into the advection equation and we talked about how we could use some of the time marching schemes that we developed previously to try to solve partial differential equations. So the initial value problem we were solving originally was just d phi dt is equal to f of phi and t. Now we just simply let that f function um, potentially include derivatives like d phi dx. So if we say d phi dx is equal to minus c d phi dx, that becomes our uh, equation that we're trying to solve, but now it's a partial differential equation. And what we discussed last time is that we can substitute that f term, which we now know or identify as minus c d phi dx, into our time marching equation. So that would just be, in this case, minus c d phi dx evaluated time index n, or for the implicit case, this would be minus c d phi dx evaluated at time index n plus 1. But obviously we're not limited to just these time marching schemes. If we wanted to do something like a Craig-Nicholson approach, this would just now include minus c d phi dx evaluated at time index n, and as well as the minus c d phi dx evaluated at time index n. So you would just create a finite difference equation now taking this into account. So we're going to move on in the next lecture to consider the diffusion equation. So the diffusion equation, or the heat equation, is d phi dt is equal to kappa d squared phi dx squared. And for this equation, we're going to need now two boundary conditions. So we'll need an initial condition, which we could say maybe something like phi at t equals to 0 is equal to 0 uniformly. And one boundary condition could be phi at x equals 0 is equal to 1. And the other boundary would be a Neumann boundary condition, which would be t phi dx at x equals to 1 is equal to 0 for all values of time. So let's start off by just simply determining what is our finite difference equation. So we're going to start by looking at an explicit Euler equation using a centered space approximation. So our explicit Euler equation is, again, phi n plus 1 is equal to phi n plus delta t times d phi dt evaluated at time index n. And in our case, that d phi dt is going to just simply be kappa d squared phi dx squared. If we want to make a centered approximation, that d squared phi dx squared term can then be further approximated by phi i minus 1 minus 2 phi i plus phi i plus 1 all divided by delta x squared. And because we're evaluating this at time index n, each one of these terms will be evaluated at time index n. So if we allow for the creation of a variable or a parameter beta, which is equal to kappa times dt over dx squared, then our equation simplifies to beta phi i minus 1 n plus 1 minus 2 beta phi i n plus beta phi i plus 1 n. And all that is equal to our phi i n plus 1. And so this would be for our interior points. So assuming we have points at both ends of the domain, this would be for i equals 2 to nx minus 1. Well, what do we do with those other two equations? Well, we have to account for the boundary conditions. So for i equals 2, 1, this is where x is equal to 0. We can say that phi 1 n plus 1 is equal to 1. That's coming from our Dirichlet boundary condition here. Okay. Notice that the Dirichlet boundary condition in this case is independent of time. So the phi 1 n plus 1 value is going to be equal to 1 regardless of the time index n, but that's not necessarily required. It could very well be something that's time dependent 
And critically, if it's going to be time dependent, we need to make sure that everything is going to be evaluated at time index n plus 1, because we always implement boundary conditions at time index n plus 1. Okay, well then let's talk about the second boundary condition, the Neumann boundary condition. So our boundary condition is g phi dx at x equals to 1, that's our other end of the domain, is equal to 0. So this corresponds to an insulating boundary condition. Well, whenever we have a boundary condition that contains a derivative, whether it be first, second, third order derivative, we simply will approximate that derivative with a finite difference approximation. Now, if you used ghost points, then this allows us to use a centered approximation, but for today's example, we're going to just use a backward approximation, assuming that the phi and x term is on the boundary. So we're going to approximate d phi dx at time index n plus 1 and at position x equals to 1 as the following. phi and x minus phi and x minus 1 divided by delta x at time index n plus 1, time index n plus 1 is equal to 0. Okay. Well, we've made efforts to figure out ways to solve or create a matrix equation where we could try to solve this problem. And so we would figure out Okay, for our forward, or sorry, for our explicit Euler equation, we're going to create a matrix equation phi n plus 1 is equal to something times phi n plus 1 plus a little b vector. And so in the first lecture, we didn't worry so much about this A matrix, but we did have a B matrix. And so we would figure out a way to get our finite difference equation and slot it into our B matrix. I'm sorry, this should just be a phi n, not phi n plus 1. And for our boundary condition, here there is no phi n terms, so there's no values in our first row of B. And we say, okay, well, then this boundary condition needs to go into my little b vector. Okay. Well, now we have a challenge because here we have, for our Neumann boundary conditions, two unknowns. So how can we go about incorporating this? Well, we have no phi n terms, and we have no right-hand side other terms. Everything is just equal to zero. So what that means is for B, our last row will be zeros. And for our little b vector, this is also equal to zero. So now we have to figure out a way to account for, and we'll just reduce this equation, phi n x n plus 1 minus phi n x minus 1 n plus 1. These two terms, the n x and the n x minus 1 values of phi at time n x n plus 1, need to go into our A matrix. And so we would say something like A n x n x is equal to 1 from our one coefficient that we could say is sitting here. And then similarly, we could say that our a nx nx minus 1 term is equal to minus 1 to account for the coefficient 1 that sort of is sitting here. So what does this result in? Well, if we were to solve for then our phi n plus 1 term, this is going to be equal to our A matrix backslash our B matrix times our phi n vector plus our little b vector. 
Well, what else is in that A matrix? Well, the rest of the rows simply contain the II term being one with no other elements filled in that matrix. Okay, so what about our implicit Euler method? Very similar, but actually perhaps uh, a little bit more streamlined in the approach. Our finite difference equation, Vn plus 1 is equal to Vn plus delta t times kappa d, d squared p dx squared. This time evaluated time index n plus 1. So we can get to phi n plus beta times phi i minus 1 n plus 1 minus 2 phi i n plus 1 plus phi i plus 1 n plus 1. And so we can rearrange, and that's going to just give us the following. B phi i minus 1 n plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 beta phi i n plus 1 minus beta phi i plus 1 n plus 1 is equal to phi i n. Boundary conditions still hold. Phi 1 n plus 1 is equal to 1, and then the phi uh, nx minus phi nx minus 1 is equal to 0. And we can get all of this now into an a times our phi n plus 1 vector is equal to a little b vector. And this little b vector may contain things like our phi n terms as well. And so if you wanted to, you could go ahead and write this out in the same notation if it sort of helps you keep everything formatted the same, you could do something like a big B matrix times our phi n vector plus a little b vector, where the big b vector is going to be mostly the identity matrix. The obvious exceptions would be the first and last rows where there is no phi n terms. So there would be no coefficients in the corresponding big B matrix. So in class, we'll go ahead and work on coding some of this up. But the final thing I want to discuss is stability. So we have shown that there are cases where our finite difference equation and our code are correct, but the simulation goes unstable. So a correct FDE will still have some degree of truncation error, order delta t, order delta x, order delta x squared, etc. This ensures that the error for a given step approximates or this ensures that the error for a given step's approximation of the governing equation is small, meaning that each individual step in time we take is producing a small amount of error. But the question is, in particular the question of stability is how do these errors produced at each step accumulate? Do they accumulate in such a way that they grow to eventually become similar to the magnitude of the signal that we're trying to simulate? Or do they stay relatively small compared to that? And that's really what we determine as whether the method is stable or unstable. So there are a number of different approaches to trying to evaluate stability. The simplest one, and one we'll discuss in this class, is one called discrete perturbation analysis. So the idea behind discrete perturbation analysis is we're going to generate an initial condition that has a single error in it. And we're going to say, okay, that, that signal has an error. If it were originally something where it was relatively smooth, and we just put a spike error at a particular point in space, what happens to that error? Does it smooth out over time? Or does that small error eventually cause the entire system to destabilize? So the nice thing about the discrete perturbation analysis is we actually just simply use the exact scheme we used for the simulation. We just use a different initial condition. Okay? We set the initial condition uniformly to zero, except at one location where we set it at a, as a value of one. Then we implement the time marching scheme and determine whether that initial source of error that has a magnitude of one, does that grow to be greater than one over the time of interest for our simulation, or does it decay towards zero? 
So one of the nice benefits of this approach is that obviously we get to see how our particular method is stable or unstable. The cost is that it costs just as much to run our stability analysis as the actual simulation itself. So we'll do an example of this in class.